Uh, welcome back to class, everybody. Uh, let's get started, and then uh, we can go and answer uh, more of your questions. But uh, just as a quick reminder on what we did last time, uh, so we began with some reminders on the projects. So our first project presentations are next Thursday, coming up really soon, okay? And so those of you that are going up first, I hope that you've been investing a tremendous amount of time in your projects. I'm looking forward to hearing them. Uh, also, uh, we uh, spent some time discussing homework six, and there's some more time uh, for questions on that today. Uh, so homework six is not officially due until the end of the semester, but we literally have uh, two more lectures, like today and Thursday, for you guys to ask questions on it. And after that, our whole class time is full of project presentations and exams and so forth. So now's the time to ask on it. Uh, and then we finished uh, our programming of minimum spanning tree. So that was an interesting optimization problem because we had to solve the uh, integer program many times. And every time we solved it, we added some more constraints to it. So uh, that's an example of row generation, a very common algorithm. People use that all the time to speed up uh, all kinds of computations that would otherwise be impossible. So if you uh, spent the time to try to write down the whole formulation with all the exponentially many constraints, you would never get done. So uh, row generation is really the only thing that made that tractable uh, for us. Uh, and then we just started on scraping web data, and we're going to get back to that today. But the plan for today is uh, to first start with your questions, whether it's on the projects like you just asked, or uh, whether it's on homework six, we can spend the time to answer those. Uh, then we're going to go back to scraping web data and look at more on how Scrapey works. And uh, towards the end of class, depending on how much time we have, we're going to look at uh, various tools that, besides what we've already learned, to make your Python programs execute lightning fast. Okay, so one of the common complaints that people have when comparing various languages is uh, they might criticize Python for being too slow. Okay. Uh, and the reason for that is because it's interpreted. So uh, that nice interface where we can interactively type things and execute things, that's the Python interpreter. And many languages like uh, C++ or Java don't have that. So they're not interpreted languages, they're compiled languages where the uh, program, uh, the code gets turned into uh, machine uh, execution or uh, basically machine code that then gets run on either your machine's processor or virtual processor, okay? So that's one of the main things that makes Python slightly slower, and there are various things that people have come up with to get around that. So what that means is that if you have a program that's slow, where maybe 90% of the execution is taking uh, place in 10% of the code, some inner loop that's getting executed thousands and thousands of times, you can go and use these tools to make that part of the code, that inner loop, be just insanely fast. Uh, and uh, we'll see some examples of that. Okay, but uh, let's just begin with your questions either on the projects or uh, on um, the homework assignments. So, uh, piggyback on that question. Uh, it seems like when you're trying to linearize these things, you end up with more, like, relationships that you need to, like, you know, instead of having one that's less than that, you have, like, three or four of the yeah. And do you have to write all of those as separate constraints, or is there a way to match them? So I can just show you a typical example yeah. of uh, of linearization. So let's say I have x and y, mm -hmm. and they're both binary. And my objective function or some constraint has some expression that has something like f uh, plus 5x times y. Mm -hmm. OK? Uh, so we could introduce a new variable z that uh, is one it only if both x and y are one, right? So we could do something like z, z is also going to be binary. So x and y were binary originally. Z here is also going to be binary. And we're going to say z is less than or equal to x, z is less than or equal to y. So that ensures that if either x or y are zero, z is going to be zero. So sometimes this might be enough depending on where the linearization is happening. Like if this is a max, and you want z to be 1, like this might be sufficient, right? right? But uh, you could also add a constraint that looks something like this. Let's say uh, z is bigger than or equal to uh, x plus y minus 1. 
So something like that. So uh, now what happens? Uh, if either x or y are uh, one, if either x or y are zero, uh, this constraint is going to make z to be less than or equal to zero, and this constraint is going to say z is bigger than or equal to either zero or minus one, right? So that so this together means that z has to be zero right. if either x or y are zero. Similarly, if both x and y are one, what's going to happen? This allows z to be one. This allows z to be one. And this, since both x and y are 1, is going to force z to be 1. Right. Does that make sense? So when I write that in Pyomo, is there a way to write those three things into one constraint? Uh, no, you'd have to have individual constraints, introduce new variables, and so forth. So uh, there, to my knowledge, and there might be somebody who's written some code for this, but uh, there isn't an automatic linearization sure, thing sure. in Pyomo. Yeah, so you'd have to do this individually for these various constraints. So other questions on either the homework assignment or the project? Okay, I'd like to do one thing about the projects which uh, I hadn't done before, and I think it's an important thing to do. So those of you that have had me for uh, class before uh, have probably uh, seen me talk about this, but uh, I'd like to just briefly talk about uh, a style guide on how to make good presentations. And uh, this should help you tremendously, especially if you're one of the first people uh, going up to uh, do your project presentations. So uh, you could watch this uh, video on it, but I'd like to just briefly go over uh, the PDF that's just some bullet points on what makes a good presentation. And uh, these bullet points really come from uh, various uh, advice that people have given me on my presentations, both when I was in grad school and since then working at various companies. So let's just go over these briefly and think about these when you're creating your presentation. Okay, so the first one is say something interesting every two minutes. So the, uh, the main thing that differentiates a good presentation from a not good presentation is content. It's really just about content. It's not about having, like, if you guys have seen Prezi or something like that, it's that presentation tool that zooms around. That does not make an interesting presentation. <laughs> content makes interesting presentation, right? Uh, so you could have, like, the barest looking slides that don't have any, like, fancy imagery or whatever on them, but it's the content that makes it interesting. So uh, think about what it is that you're saying and what is, makes it interesting for your audience, okay? And make sure that there's something interesting on every slide or every second slide or so forth. So uh, the next bullet point is really goes into what defines the word interesting. And it's really your audience. It's not you, okay? So I'll give you an example that uh, is especially pertinent to this class, uh, which is you've spent probably weeks coding your project, right? And so something that might be very tempting to do is put up a bunch of Python code on your slide, okay? That because you've poured like so much effort on into your code. But uh, your audience might be much more interested in something uh, at a more abstract level than that. Like what makes this code interesting than other code? Like are you using some tool? And if you're using some tool, maybe you can just focus on the tool as opposed to show your code, because that's what's interesting to your audience and not the code itself. Uh, or if there's some analysis, uh, it's the analysis that's interesting and not the code, right? So uh, the word interesting really is about your audience and not about you. Uh, the next one is use examples. So this is really uh, important uh, for presentations, especially on projects that you've worked on for a long time. So imagine that you've done some research project for three months, six months, whatever. Uh, you might know it really, really well, and it might seem totally trivial to you. But for your audience, it's the first time they're seeing it. And so a simple example can really help them understand uh, what's going on, okay? So uh, use an example to really highlight what the problem is, what the inputs are, what the outputs are, why the outputs make sense, and so forth. It's never a waste of time to do that, uh, and it always helps your audience understand. Uh, so never flash a slide. So if you're going to have something in your slide deck, 
make sure that it's on the screen long enough for people to actually understand what's there. So if there's a figure or something or a graph, explain what the axes are. Explain like what the bars mean. Explain what the audience is supposed to get out of looking that, at that graph. So uh, maybe many of you have been in presentations where there might be like five graphs and people will say, well, this shows this, this shows that. And for me as an audience member, usually like I just space out at that point because it's too little time for me to actually process what they're saying. So spend the time to actually explain what's on your slide and don't flash it. Uh, use diagrams uh, and almost no text. So these two things uh, go together. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is a PDF. I would never do this if this was actual presentation, okay? Uh, so this is way too much text for a slide. Uh, so your slide should be such that when you put it on the screen, just by looking at it, people should be able to absorb what's on there. So that means no paragraphs of text. Usually my rule of thumb is if I have bullet points, they have something like three or four words after the bullet point, not a big long sentence or something like that. And the reason is that if you have a bunch of text, when you're talking, people have the choice to either listen to you uh, or read what's on your slide. And you don't want to give them that choice. Like they should just always be listening to you as opposed to looking at what's on the slide. Uh, so almost no text. And uh, diagrams really help in terms of people's understanding of concepts. So use visualizations, use matplotlib, like draw some uh, more things that might be useful. If you've never used this uh, uh, drawing uh, software called uh, Inkscape, it might help you create custom visualizations for your talk. I use it all the time for my talks. So uh, use diagrams. So this is a huge uh, issue for especially operations research. So you may have seen this with our speakers in our se uh, weekly seminar. Uh, in, uh, it may be an issue in other fields as well. But people will show like a big table of real numbers, right? So I ran this and I got like 16,784 or something like that, right? But the audience doesn't care. <laughs> like it, the actual exact value doesn't matter. What matters is like, what's the meaning behind it? What should I be getting out of it? So instead of having a table of real numbers, use a bar graph, use like a line graph, like make it into some visually interesting thing that's easy for the audience to consume, right? Um, like what's the key thing that people should be getting out of those uh, real numbers? So use a heat map, something like that. Uh, so similar to this, no long equations. So oftentimes people will put up like a gigantic formulation of an integer program or something that's really hard to understand and really there's no hope for the audience to understand in the 30 seconds that it's on the slide, right? So instead of having these long equations, you might think of putting English text for the constraint or for the objective. What does it actually mean? You know, and you could put the English text and then substitute it with the, uh, uh, with the symbols that actually represent that. Because what's important is the meaning of it, right? And not like the symbols uh, that actually describe it. Uh, so the next one's also something that I especially see with people who haven't done many presentations before, which is they'll have a repeated outline, right? And many uh, presentation packages let you automatically create these and insert them into your presentation, where it'll be like, you know, step one, B, A, B, C, step two, A, B, C. That's not useful. Uh, the audience, like, usually doesn't want to see those. Instead of having those, just have a clear organization, like organize your thought flow, use some transition sentences between slides, and the organization is going to be clear to the audience, and uh, that outline is not going to have to be flashed on the screen. If you ever have this, usually I just use three bullets, something like, I'm going to explain to you what the problem is, I'll talk to you about the data I've collected, and then we'll look at some analysis. You know, like that's the most detailed an outline should ever get, really. Uh, the next one is control your audience's attention. And me pointing to the screen is an example of that, okay? So uh, I've also seen this in people who haven't done uh, presentations very often, is uh, they'll talk for a long time, but it's not exactly clear how what they're saying is connected to what's on the screen. And pointing to the screen really helps focus people's attention on what you want them to be thinking about at that particular moment in time. So uh, control your audience's attention. 
Uh, the next one, be on time. So uh, audiences typically expect a talk to be of a certain length, right? So we go to a seminar, we expect it to be about like 50 minutes, and plus or 10% of that, people are pretty happy, right? So like you go 10% under 50 minutes, it's okay. 10% over 50 minutes, it's okay. But nothing makes an audience less happy than a talk that's not on time, right? Like, it's either just too short and people think, well, you know, why did I come here? Or it's too long and uh, people are not, you know, wanted to leave half an hour ago. Uh, and so be on time. Uh, and the final one is kind of the same thing that I've been telling you about um, the projects in general, which is when people remember you giving your project presentation or your talk or uh, what have you, the thing that's going to differentiate them thinking that it was a good one or not is whether they can remember if they learned something from you, okay? And if they remember that they learned something from your presentation, that's like a huge win for you, regardless of whether it's a presentation at a company, at a, a scientific event, or in a class, right? Uh, so if they remember, hey, you know, from this project I learned this, uh, that's what's really going to differentiate you as having a good talk uh, versus somebody uh, who has a disorganized talk and it's not exactly clear what the audience came from it. Um, so uh, in terms of uh, what makes uh, audiences think uh, that they've learned something, it's, it's two things. One, it has to be understandable, and two, it has to be complicated enough, right? So if it's too simple and understandable, people are going to be unhappy. But if it's complicated but not understandable, people are also going to be unhappy. So both of those things have to be true for people to leave thinking that they learned something. So uh, think about these bullet points as you're preparing your slides. And uh, I'm looking forward to your presentations. People usually put a tremendous amount of effort into the projects, uh, and I think that we're going to all learn a lot from them. Okay, so uh, if there's no questions about that or about anything else, uh, let's move on to our next topic, uh, which was scraping uh, web data. And just to briefly remind you where we were last time, uh, the main difference in what I'm talking about now versus what I usually talk about is that uh, the method for scraping web data is not just a module. So it's not something like SciPy or Pandas that you just simply import but it's an entire framework called Scrapy. So uh, that means that there's a bunch of modules in there, but it, there's also a bunch of pre-written programs that let you execute those modules in standard ways. So things that we learned uh, last time are that uh, you can create a project by doing something like Scrapy start project, and then you can name it whatever you want. And it creates a whole bunch of directories. And uh, one of those directories is the spiders directory. And that's where you're going to define your programs that are going to go over a bunch of websites and collect the data from those websites. And uh, we've just started looking at uh, the spider that uh, I've programmed here. So let's go back and take a look at that. So uh, this is what a spider looks like. Uh, it's a class. It imports from the Scrapey Spider class, and you have to give it a unique name because your project might have many spiders in it. So this one's just called posts. And there are some uh, methods that your spider has that have fixed names, OK? So uh, this, the first one that we talked about last time is uh, start requests. And all that start requests does is it identifies which are the website URLs that we're going to go to uh, for starting our spider, OK? And uh, where we ended class last time is with a description of the yield statement. So what the yield statement does is it's, it's like a return, but if you call the function the second time, it's going to maintain the context, right? So uh, if, I'm, uh, if this for loop is getting executed over many URLs, in this particular example, it's just one, but if it's getting executed over many URLs, then the first time I call it, it's going to give me the first URL, the second time, the second one, the third time, the third one, and so forth, right? Uh, so going back to the actual spider instead of just the yield statement in general, let's look at what we're yielding, okay? So in the simple example that we did at the end of class last time, 
I was just yielding an integer, right? So we iterated over the integer one, two, three, so forth. But here I'm yielding a different type of object. So it's not an integer, it's not an array, it's a scrapey request, okay? So a scrapey request basically tells a spider to go to a particular URL, and after collecting the uh, HTML, like sending the request to the online server, getting the response back, it's gonna uh, call this callback function. So here under callback, I could have passed anything that I wanted, okay? But in this particular case, I'm passing self.parse. And what that's going to do is once the URL gets called, self.parse is gonna get called with a response object, okay? And we're gonna process these response objects to actually pull out the data that we want from the website. So uh, let me, uh, uh, and Scrapey has some tools to help you uh, sort of understand exactly what that means. So let's use those tools first and then we're gonna come back uh, to this code to understand exactly what it means. Okay, so one of the tools that uh, Scrapey has is uh, called the Scrapey shell, okay? So you could do something like this, Scrapey shell and then pass in a URL. And what that's going to do is uh, it's going to create this requests object or this response object that gets passed into sparse, uh, into parse. So uh, let's try to do that here. So I'm going back to the top of the OR blog. So let's do scrapey shell. On this uh, particular website. And so here I uh, got a bunch of debug statements. So let's uh, read them a little bit. So uh, the interesting parts are maybe uh, these things here. So this is Scrapey actually going to that website uh, and uh, collecting the information from it. Uh, and then uh, over here it's printing out some uh, information on what object it's created. In particular, uh, it's created this request object, okay? So uh, the request object is what um, And it's created the response object also. So the response object is what gets p passed into parse, okay? So before we look at the uh, methods on that uh, response object, let's just talk about web pages uh, in general a little bit. So this was the blog that we're going to uh, try to ex extract data from. And if you recall, what we wanted to do was extract uh, the dates of the posts and maybe the post titles uh, into a nice CSV that then we can do analysis on it. So uh, how many are f of you just by a show of hands are familiar with XML or HTML or how that works in general? Okay, so uh, if you haven't, if you're not, then let me sh sort of briefly describe to you how uh, how the content of websites that get displayed on your browser works, okay? So, uh, so this, get, this looks like this, but what your browser is actually getting is something that looks like this, what I'm highlighting on the right, okay? So it's a text file, and let me see if I can increase the font here so you can see it a little better. So it's literally a text file, the same way that the code for our uh, Python programs are text files. So it's a text file that looks like this. Here, uh, the first tag is a tag that's called HTML. It has this particular attribute. It has some language attribute. After the HTML tag, there's another uh, tag called head, uh, another tag called body, and so forth. So what's a tag? A tag uh, is a, a way to or organize information on this uh, web page, okay? So uh, you can think of it as just the start of a block of information and the end of a block of information. So uh, let's maybe just take a look at the head tag. So this, it starts a block of information called head. It has a title, some other information inside of it. And then towards the end here, there's a uh, the end of that block of information. Does that make sense? And these blocks are nested. So within the head block of information, uh, there is a script block of information, and there's a style block of information, and a link block of information, and so forth. 
So each of these blocks are kind of nested within each other uh, in what people often call uh, the document tree, okay? So the root tag, the tag that contains the whole document in this particular example is the HTML tag. And inside the HTML tag, there are two child, child tags, the head and the body. And the body includes like all the d information that's actually displayed on the website and the head just includes some meta information, that's extra information about the website. So I could go and click on this, say, and click inspect. And what that does, uh, or what my browser does here, is it sort of highlights what this block of information actually corresponds to in terms of the displayed uh, on the website. Does that make sense? And uh, over here, you can see the path that uh, from the root tag down to this particular block of information. So oftentimes, these paths can get very, very complicated because they're computer generated. So it starts at the root tag, that's the HTML. Uh, then there's the body. Then there's a wrapper, a container, a content, a post, blah, 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 a div, a div, a p that actually uh, goes down to this particular block of information, OK? So what we need to do with our spider is somehow write a program to, out of this whole website, automatically select the blocks of information that correspond to the uh, dates and that correspond to the titles, OK? So uh, I'm going to show you a relatively easy way to do this, and then we'll talk about some harder ways to do it. Okay, but the harder ways are, of course, more flexible. So um, the easier way to do it is with a browser plugin that uh, people have wrote called Selector Gadget. Okay, so you can go to Selector Gadget and you can install it on your browser, and that's what I've done over here. So, um, so here it is. That's the uh, Selector Gadget plugin, and when you start it. Um, So uh, as I mouse over particular blocks in the HTML tree, it's going to highlight them, right? And if I click on a block, it basically means I want to figure out how to select that block. So uh, let's try to select uh, like these start dates, OK? So I click on that. And uh, all of the things, all of the blocks that I've uh, selected are going to get highlighted in yellow. Okay, so this is the one I clicked on. So it looks like it's only selecting the dates. And down here, uh, what Selector Gadget uh, does is it outputs. Um, a query that you can run on the response object that should return those dates, okay? So the query is just dot published. So let's see how this corresponds to something that we're going to do in Scrapy. So this query, by the way, just kind of as a, a brief aside, this query is something uh, called uh, a CSS query. Um, and uh, there's tutorials on what these queries actually mean. So for example, if I just type in an element P, then it selects all parts of the document that are P, right? So if I typed in body, it would select the whole body tag, right? If I typed in head, it would select the head tag. If I type in uh, P, it'll select all the P's. And uh, we did dot element, so it selects all div elements and all P elements. So uh, somewhere in here, uh, there is a dot. Uh, so dot class, like dot intro, it selects all elements with class intro. So uh, dot published means it's going to select all elements that have class equal to published. Okay, so let's uh, actually execute that in Scrapy to see what happens. So this is our response object. Um, so if I do response, let's see. Uh, if I do response.txt, it actually outputs 
what my browser downloaded from the web page server, right? So it's all these tags, the HTML, the body tag, and blah, blah, blah. So completely uh, like human, very difficult to read, right? Uh, but we're going to process this by running uh, some queries on it. So we're going to use this uh, CSS query method, and I'm going to do dot published, which is what selector gadget returned to me, okay? So if I run that, uh, it's going to output a bunch of answers, and I want to look at them in a human readable fashion. So uh, let me say extract all, or just extract. So now it's uh, actually outputting uh, all of the blocks of information out of that web page that that particular query took out, okay? So uh, it took out uh, this, which had class published, this, which had class published, this, which had cla class published, and so forth. And those were all the dates that got displayed on the web page, right? And uh, in fact, there was uh, some other maybe slightly more specific dates. So this is the date that actually gets displayed, but here I have the actual time maybe when this was published, okay? So uh, in terms of uh, me extracting the data, it's I maybe want to extract this non-visible element as opposed to the vis this visible element. Does that make sense? Okay, so uh, we're going to use something like that to extract the dates, and we can look at uh, in a little bit how to uh, how we might change that. So let's go back to the web page and uh, see how we can extract the titles. Okay, so we have now a, a CSS query that's going to extract the dates. We want to extract the titles, and we're going to do it the same way. We're going to uh, just run uh, selector gadget. And uh, now instead of clicking on a date, I want to click on this title, okay? But now I clicked on the title, and uh, it's also selecting things like this. Like, I don't want this, right? I also don't want that. I want just the titles. Uh, so the way that uh, you do that in Selector Gadget is by right-clicking on this, or by clicking on the things you don't want that were selected, okay? So I don't want this, so I clicked on it. And uh, so this is saying, I do want that, but not that, right? So now I can scroll through the rest of the web page to see what else it's selecting. So it's selecting this title, looks pretty good. Selecting uh, this title, selecting that one, selecting that one, that one, that one. So it's looking pretty good. It looks like it's only selecting the titles now, uh, as opposed to the titles and a bunch of other information that I don't want, okay? So let's now try to run this uh, CSS query on the response object to see what we're actually going to get. So uh, here it is, so response.css, and it was something like dot entry title A. Okay, so uh, let's see what this is actually returning. So uh, it's returning the link to that uh, particular post, right? So uh, it's a block of information that's in this A tag that has a link to the specific post, a title uh, to that post, uh, some other attribute, and then this is the actual text of the post. This is what actually got displayed on the website, okay? And out of this, I want maybe just that text or maybe just this text. I don't want the whole tag. And the same thing is true here, right? I don't want this whole tag. I want either just uh, this time field or just that time field, right? So uh, let's be a little bit more specific in uh, extracting out of these things uh, exactly the piece of information that we want. So there are several ways to do this. So uh, let's go back to... Um, go back to the dates because they were maybe slightly easier to uh, work with and then we can come back to the titles. Okay, so these were the dates and let's say that I want to extract uh, just uh, just this, uh, this part. Okay, so just uh, this as opposed to uh, this more specific time and then we can try to do the other one. Okay, 
So one way to do it is you could at this point use a regular expression. So all of you are familiar with this. Uh, so let's try to write a regular expression that just extracts uh, these dates out of uh, these uh, out of these uh, strings. So uh, can somebody help me write that? Okay, so l I'm going to write something and then maybe it'll work and maybe it won't. Uh, so let's read this and then we can run it to see if I get an error or not. So it's saying any character, as many as you want, but then there has to be a closing bracket. Okay, so I'm hoping that this is going to eat all of that and it's going to end right there. Then I'm saying capture whatever it is before uh, you get a closing bracket and then some other stuff, okay? So I'm hoping to capture this and then that uh, with the last dot star. So let's see if this works. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. Okay, so this seemed to do the trick to actually extract that part. There's various other ways uh, to do this. So I think another way to do it is something like, uh, Let's see, text. Let's see how I did it here. Okay, so here I guess I did it with a uh, regular expression. Oh, but I think it's like this. Text and then extract. Okay, so uh, CSS queries in addition to selecting the element as a whole, could actually select the text within the element, right? So uh, this, the published element, so let's go back and look at that, was uh, this abbreviation tag, right? Or this ABBR tag. But I don't want the, any of the tag information, I just want the text that's inside the tag. So that's what this, uh, colon colon text that I did actually does. It extracts the text part of the uh, tag, okay? Uh, so I think there's another way uh, to do it. So let's see. Let's try this, attribute title. Okay, so if you do uh, attribute and then you pass in the name of an attribute, it's going to actually pull out the value of that attribute. Does that make sense? So in this abbreviation tag, we had s several attributes. So one is this class, another is this title, and so forth. And each of them have values like published in this thing. And by doing uh, colon colon attribute title, I'm pulling out the actual values of that attribute, which is the more specific time as opposed to this uh, time that actually got displayed. Okay? So uh, help me with the other ones. Uh, so let's take a look at the um, the actual response. Um, the so this part, the entry title a. So response dot css entry title A. Okay, so this was supposed to be the titles of all the posts. But instead of getting the title, right now I'm getting this A tag that has this link on it, uh, this bit, uh, and then uh, the actual title, and then the end of the tag right there. So help me extract the actual title of the post uh, from that. So any suggestions? Say again? Okay, so you want to do colon colon text. Yeah, so this seems to work really well, right? Which, uh, because what it's doing is, out of this tag, it's ignoring the actual tag and taking the text inside the tag, which is that bit, which is the part that I want, right? Uh, so suppose that instead of this, I like this title more. So help me extract that title as opposed to the other one. 
Yeah. So I do attribute title, was it? Uh, like that, and then I pull out those uh, titles, okay? So that's the way that we're gonna take one of these response objects and out of that big complicated uh, computer readable but not human readable mess, we're gonna extract just the information that we want, okay? Uh, and I'm gonna come back to this a little bit later to show you some more advanced techniques of extracting this information as well. But for most of the things that you would want, I think the CSS queries that we've learned are probably sufficient. So let's see uh, what I actually have in my uh, spider code here. So uh, this is extracting the dates. Uh, instead of using the nice CSS functionality that we just uh, learned about, here I'm using a uh, regular expression, okay? So, uh, but it's gonna achieve essentially the same thing. It's gonna pull out uh, those, um, uh, the dates that of each of the publications, and this is gonna pull out uh, the uh, text of each of the titles, okay? So now I have a list of dates and a list of titles. Uh, so what I wanna do now is tell my spider that this is the information I want and that it should record it, okay? The way that you do that is by yielding a dictionary. So uh, we're gonna create a dictionary, and these two things are, you can think of them as uh, column titles for a CSV that we're gonna create, okay? So we're gonna create a CSV with two columns. One of them is gonna be date, that's gonna be the date of the post, and another one's gonna be title, that's the title of the post, okay? So what I'm doing here is taking these lists, each of which have about 10 uh, elements in it, which is all the posts displayed on the first page. And I'm uh, zipping them together so that uh, I'm matching up the, a particular date with its corresponding title. Does that make sense? So we're going through uh, these pairs of date and title. Here I'm incrementing the count. So what's self.count? Uh, it's a variable that I created here at the beginning that just makes sure that I don't extract too many of these. I want 45 at most. So here I'm just keeping track of how many of uh, these I've extracted. Uh, and then I'm gonna yield the dictionary that I create. Here the key is date, and then uh, the value is the actual date, and the, ti uh, the key is title, and the value is the actual title that we pulled from the web website. Uh, and then if the count is too big, then we're just gonna return. So uh, return is different than yield, right? So return means like I'm not gonna come back to this function whereas yield means that I get called again and I get called again and I get called again, right? Okay, so uh, as we go through this loop, we're gonna iterate and we're gonna yield a bunch of these pairs of dates and titles, okay? Uh, but I want 45 of them and on this first page, let's see how many of them there are. So this was uh, us extracting the titles. But as you can see, there's a lot less than 45. There's about 10 of them, right? So I need to have the spider somehow automatically go to a different page and extract some more. So in particular, let's go back and take a look at uh, the blog. So if it was you uh, navigating this website and you wanted to find some more posts, what you would do is you go down to this bottom link and click on older posts that's going to take you to another web page that has more posts on it, right? And so forth. So what we need to do is to tell the spider to automatically find this link and go to it and continue processing from there, okay? And the way that we're gonna tell it to find this link is exactly the same way that we told it to find the titles and the uh, dates. So uh, let's, let's create a little CSS query for that. So right now, uh, the query I'm getting is nav below A, and uh, I'm just kind of quickly making sure that this doesn't accidentally select something else. Say again? Oh yeah, yeah, it says, uh, that's right, that's right. So in parentheses here, it's telling me how many things it's selected. So it's selected only one, so I don't need to check, because I know that it's selected the one I clicked on. 
Okay, so let's go back to the uh, shell and do uh, response.css nav below a extract. Okay, so uh, again it's going to give me one of these blocks of information uh, that's uh, one of these link blocks. And what I want from this is not the text. I don't want the older posts. I don't want anything else other than this URL because that's where I want the spider to go next, okay? So uh, help me actually extract that URL from there. So what should I, what do I need to add here? Yeah, attribute href, and that's gonna actually give me that particular link, okay? So let's see what my spider is doing after it, uh, it yields all those pairs of uh, dates and titles. Uh, the next thing it does is it uh, creates a variable next page that's going to be uh, nav below attribute href. So it's that URL, okay? And then it yields, so here we were yielding dictionaries, and now we're gonna yield a scrapey request, which is something that looks exactly like what we yielded for a start page, right? So we're gonna yield a scrapey request the URL is going to be next page and the callback is going to be self.parse. Does that make sense? So it's basically telling the spider, click on this link, get the response object, and then call this function again, which means I'm going to go through and select titles, I'm going to select dates, I'm going to look at for older post link again, and so forth. Does that make sense? So th the one part that I haven't explained is this URL join uh, line which is that sometimes uh, links on web pages are relative instead of absolute. So what I mean by that is um, this is an absolute link because it has the whole like HTTP blah, 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 right? But sometimes on a web page, people could specify this by just writing something like blog page two, okay? And uh, this is just a helper function that Scrapey provides for us that can turn a uh, relative link into an absolute link, okay? So this is just making sure that if it's relative, it turns it into an absolute, because that's what request needs is an absolute one, and then we're actually gonna send out the request. But you had a question? Uh, yeah, um, basically the same thing, but uh, so the URL join in, inside that, that, they actually check whether it's relative. That's right, and it's gonna return the absolute one, because that's the one that I actually want. And so that's why uh, we turn it into an absolute one here and here we actually yield the request, okay? So if I didn't have this uh, counting, if I didn't have self.count, what's going to happen here is uh, the spider would go to older posts, would process this page, would go to older posts, process this page, and keep going on and on until it can no longer find uh, an older post link, basically, right? But I want to stop it before that, and that's why we have the counter that goes up to 45, and then we're going to return. So uh, let's, let's go back and actually call our spider to do, the, uh, to do the actual data collection. So the way that we're going to call the spider is by doing, um, going to the main directory of the project. So that's the main directory of the project. Uh, and we're going to call scrapey crawl the name of the spider, so this is the name I created. I picked the name posts. So uh, scrapey crawl posts. And by doing this dash O, you're basically uh, specifying the way that you want the results written out. So remember that my parse function is just returning these dictionaries. And so scrapey has written several different output formatters. So one of them is a CSV, but there's various other useful formats that people use. But for us, let's just look at the CSV one because that's the one we're familiar with in terms of working with pandas and so forth. So I'm just gonna output in, into a file that we're just gonna call them like postdates.csv. And uh, let's see what this does. Okay, so uh, Scrapey now is outputting a bunch of information and each of these uh, pauses is basically Scrapey go pausing for a second to go to a new URL, looking at that new URL, taking the information from there, processing it, yielding some more items, and so forth. 
Now, oftentimes, if you're trying to scrape from a website like CNN or BBC or something like that, uh, one of the things that uh, might happen is that uh, the website might block you, okay? Because, like, if a website sees, like, a whole bunch of requests from the same IP address, like, all, like, what, right next to each other, they think that you're not a person, which this is not. It's a spider, right? And so they want to limit the amount of bandwidth that they're wasting on you, and so they might block you. So there's various ways to tell Scrapey how fast it should go, right? So you can tell it wait, like, 30 seconds be between each, like, URL request, okay? And that's going to make sure that you're not getting blocked because you're not consuming too much of that website's bandwidth. And you can just like run this overnight. And if it takes like 10 hours to collect your data, it takes 10 hours, right? But in the end, like you're going to have it on uh, your disk so you can actually process it. So let's actually take a look at what we got as output. So this is our CSV file. So uh, you know the dates, uh, the titles, and so forth. So this is our 45 posts that we wanted. Uh, so some, somehow in Pandas, there's a way to actually uh, turn this uh, date into an actual date object in Python. So you could start automatically computing things like the time between posts and so forth. Uh, and then, uh, of course, yeah, oh yeah, it's like two two date time. That's what it is. Yeah, so there we go. So if we do df dot date equals this, now it's an actual date time object, right? So now you can start computing uh, differences and so forth. And then. Uh, So it looks like I have an accidental space in title, but uh, then th uh, these are all the titles. Okay, so we can go and do analysis on that. So I hope that uh, at this point you think this is awesome, right? Because that's ridiculously like complicated data to manually actually like collect, right? But it took us almost no lines of code. Uh, to actually go and write a very complex program that processes multiples of these web pages and collects this data into a nice format for our analysis. So um, let's, before we move on to uh, the next topic, I want to go back uh, to the Scrapey shell and uh, show you some more complicated ways of uh, doing searches. Okay, so the uh, one way that is the kind of automatic way that we saw using selector gadget is this uh, CSS uh, selectors or CSS queries. Uh, and so you can read some more about them here, but it selects uh, blocks with particular elements. Uh, it's, so this we used one of these, so it selects an element with an ID. So when we did nav below, it meant that that particular tag had an ID uh, that was nav below, okay? Um, and uh, you can do various other things. But this one is perhaps slightly less used than the other more complicated way, uh, which is uh, called XPath. So uh, XPath is uh, its own query language that people developed specifically for uh, XML or HTML type data, which is this data that's inside of these blocks, okay? Uh, so in addition to web pages and web browsers, tons and tons of other data in lots and lots of companies get stored this way, okay? There are these like tags of blocks and blocks within blocks and so forth and attributes inside of these things. 
And so in general, it's useful to be familiar with this type of uh, storage and uh, how to access it. Okay, so um, each tag is sometimes called a node. So uh, typing bookstore selects all nodes with the name bookstore. Uh, slash bookstore selects the root element uh, bookstore. Slash slash book selects all book elements no matter where they are in the document. So uh, just to kind of introduce you to the syntax here, what they mean by document is some arbitrary uh, marked up information like this, okay? So before we saw HTML, head, body, blah, blah, blah. But none of that is actually fixed in the markup language. You can have whatever markup you want, right? So uh, this might be a bookstore company uh, that has a whole bunch of books stored in this type of uh, data storage format, okay? So here the root element is bookstore, and then inside of it are a bunch of uh, book tags, and each book has, might have a title, might have a price, and so forth, okay? Uh, and the title has a language uh, attribute, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, let's try to use XPath to select uh, the titles of the postings, okay? So I just want to go back and um, select just the titles of the postings as we had um, before. So they look like this, and that's using a CSS query. But let's try to do the same thing with XPath. Okay, so what kind of an element do I want to select? Right, I want to select an A element because uh, that's, that's the kind of uh, sort of block of information that I'm looking for here. Okay, uh, and this A element could appear anywhere in the document. So uh, we can go here and uh, I can select all A elements. So here it is, I selected all A elements. But if I select all A elements, And let's maybe just take a look at the length of this. It's going to be way more than 10. Because uh, what, what A is, is, is a link, OK? So it's going to select every link in that document. And I don't want every link. I only want links that look like this. So uh, can you help me somehow uh, figure out what are the right A's? Right, so I don't necessarily want all the A's. And so one thing that might help is going back to the blog and clicking on one of the links that you want and then going to uh, inspect, okay? So this is an A, but it's inside of an H2, okay? So now help me say, I want an A that's inside of an H2. Right, so I don't want all the A's. I want an A that's inside of an H2. And uh, the way that you do that in XPath is something like this. So select all book elements that are descendant of bookstore element, no, no matter where they are under the bookstore element. So help me say I want all the A's that are inside of an H2. So what should I do? Okay. So this is a little different uh, than what you said, okay? Uh, so here, I'm basically saying that the A has to be immediate descendant of H2, where if I did a double slash, I think it might say it's not in necessarily immediate, but anywhere inside of the H2, okay? So let's see uh, how many I'm getting here. So here I'm getting 10, okay? And uh, let's see what they are. <coughs> Okay, they're pretty much the ones that we wanted before, right? But now I want their actual title attribute or their text or something like that. So let's go back to XPath and see if we can uh, do something 
that uh, selects the attribute. Yeah, and it looks like we could do something like this, at title, uh, and that's just going to select the title attribute of that tag as opposed to the whole thing. So, uh, so let's try to do that. Okay, so uh, so that actually selected the title attribute uh, that we wanted. Say again. After A, because uh, out of all of these A elements, uh, I want to take their title. Uh, so in that tutorial, they're saying select all attributes that are named Lang, so out of everywhere. But I want out of just the A's that I picked to get their titles. And uh, I think there's another thing we could do here. Let's see. I think if we do text, it's going to actually pick the text. Okay. So uh, the difference here is that we're not relying on selector gadget to work properly. Okay. You know, it's a cool tool that somebody wrote. It saved us a bunch of time to find the right CSS queries, but maybe it's going to break down on the website that you're working on, okay? Uh, or maybe it's not even a, a HTML. Maybe it's not even a website. Maybe it's one of these bookstore things. And at that point, uh, it's probably worth it to know a little bit about how XPath works to be able to construct a query that actually gets at the information that you want. So I, I've definitely had to use uh, XPath uh, for various companies that I've worked with before. Okay, so a uh, useful thing to know about uh, if you run into it uh, sometime. Okay, so uh, this is all that I wanted to say about um, scraping web data. Uh, are there any questions before I move on to our next topic? Okay, if not, let's talk about uh, making Python really fast. Okay, so uh, in this file that I've pre-programmed, I took an example from one of our previous homework assignments. So something very similar to what you guys did on uh, homework four when we were doing the large scale uh, machine learning where we had to compute gradients, right? So there we had this really complicated uh, computation for computing the gradient of a multinomial logistic classifier that had lots of logs and exponents and sums of exponents and so forth. And so uh, here I've programmed several ways of uh, computing something like that. So uh, just to kind of remind you, uh, we had some parameters that were the parameters of our uh, machine learning problem. So here I might have two sets of parameters, each with 7,000 entries, and I had a bunch of data that's like our images uh, that, let's say, 50 images, each with 7,000 coordinates, okay? And I need to use these two things to compute something like a gradient, but here I've simplified it a bunch so that we can uh, read through it slightly easier, okay? Uh, so let's read through just the standard Python for loop uh, implementation to see what we're computing. Uh, so we're going to uh, just return two things, right? Uh, one for each set of uh, parameters. And all that we're going to return is... Um, well, let's, let's read through it and then we can write it down to make sure that we understand. So I'm going to iterate over our parameters. I'm going to iterate over the data. And I'm going to compute the dot product of that piece of data with that parameter set, OK? And then uh, I'm going to take uh, e to that dot product. So this should look very familiar as what we did in uh, the homework assignment, right? So we had e to the parameters for a particular image times uh, dot producted with the image data. Uh, and we have this sum of exponentials that was in the denominator. Uh, and uh, so at the end, after we take the sum of exponentials, we're just going to do one over that sum of exponentials. So something reminiscent of the homework assignment, but not exactly the same. Okay? 
Uh, but it's reasonably complicated. Some dot products, some exponents, and then a reciprocal at the end, okay? Uh, so uh, let's just line by line kind of read through here to make sure we know what's going on. So uh, the dot product starts at zero. We're iterating over each element in the piece of data and in the parameters, multiplying them together and adding them to the dot product. Once I've computed that dot product, I'm going to take my answer here, which is going to be the sum of exponentials, and adding the next exponential to it, which is math.x of this dot product. After I've computed the exponential, I'm going to iterate through these, the answer again, uh, and then just do uh, 1 over whatever that value is. Okay? Make sense? Okay, so that's the standard uh, Python way of computing things with for loops. And this is uh, what we spent a considerable amount of time in class learning, which is just avoiding the for loops and using vectorization in SciPy, right? So uh, let's read through this. So uh, the dot products, how am I going to do that? So I reshape the data by adding an extra dimension in the middle, and I multiply it with the parameters, right? So now uh, when, I, when this happens, what's going to happen is the parameters are going to get, the first parameter is going to get multiplied by all the data, the second parameter is going to get multiplied by all the data, and then we're going to sum across this last axis, which is actually doing the dot product, right? So at the end here, I have a 50 by 2 array. And uh, what happens after that is I take the exponent of that 50 by 2 array, I sum across the zeroth axis, which is the 50, and take the reciprocal of that to give me uh, these reciprocals that we want, right? Uh, so using a piece of paper and a pen and some of your knowledge from class, I think all of you would have been able to come up with this code. Make sense? Okay, so that's the second option for writing the same piece of code. So now let me introduce you to some options that uh, you're perhaps less familiar with. Uh, the next option is uh, that we can actually stick C++ code inside of Python, okay? And we can have Python compile that C++ code, pass parameters into it, and read the data out. So uh, the way that that's done is with a module called scipyweave, or scipy.weave. Uh, and it just stands for weaving in C++ code uh, inside your Python code. So let's read through this function. And by the way, this is a nightmare to debug, OK? Uh, like, it took me a long time to debug this. Uh, and we can talk about why that is in just a moment. But let's read through it first. So. The function takes in the parameters and the data as before. And the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to extract all the little uh, pieces of data that we need to actually write our C++ code. Okay? So in the C++ code, I need to know what's the vector length, how many parameters are there, how, much, how many pieces of data are there. Right? So this was 7,000, 2, and 50. And then I'm going to create a space for the answer, which is our uh, two pieces of information that's the, the two reciprocals, okay? And now the C++ code is going to go into Python as a string. So uh, that's this part here. So let's uh, read that string, okay? So this is, so how many of you have done C++ programming before? So, you know, maybe about 30%. So uh, for those of you that are not familiar, this is what C++ code looks like. It's a bunch of for loops. You're familiar with for loops. So we're going to iterate over the parameters, starting with the 0th one and so forth. We're going to iterate over the pieces of data, starting with the 0th one. This is the dot product that starts at 0. We're going to iterate over the indices to the vectors, uh, all the way up to the vector length. And the dot product gets added by uh, accessing the right parameter times the right data. Okay. That gets added to the dot product. Uh, and here we take the exponent of that dot product. And here we take the reciprocals, OK? Looks very, very similar to the Python code that we wrote just in C++. Uh, the reason it's a nightmare to debug is because uh, 
C++ code might not compile, and then you get much more obscure errors than you do in Python. And so uh, this printf is, uh, is left over from when I was debugging this code. Uh, so n now we're actually going to call that code. So what that is is scipy weave inline. I'm going to pass in this whole string that's the C++ code. And then I'm going to pass in the names of all the data that needs to get communicated between the C++ code and Python. Okay? And the data that I need to uh, communicate is v length, n params, n data, params, and data. Right? So all and answer, right? So that's the thing that's going to actually uh, get returned. Uh, I also need to tell it what C++ headers this code has to be compiled with. So in particular, exp is in CMath. So that's why I'm passing in CMath uh, in here. And then verbose2 just says, print out the information as you're compiling this. So let me just uh, comment out some things, and then we can run this to compare. OK, so uh, let me just show you what happens if we do um, weave inline the passing in the params and the data that we have. Okay, so what happens is the f first time that that function gets called is we outputted a whole bunch of information that's uh, Python compiling that C++ code that I created. Okay, so this first time that it gets called, it's slow. And the reason that it's slow is because I had to go through that compi compilation step of turning the C++ code into machine code. But the next time that I uh, call it, it's fast, because it doesn't have to go through the compilation uh, part anymore. So uh, we're going to compare this with the other ones in just a moment. But I want to look at the very last uh, option. So one option was just regular Python. The second option was vectorizing. The third option was scipy weave. And uh, the last option is a package called uh, Numba. So this is a relatively new package. So uh, several years ago, when I looked for things like this online, it didn't exist. And it's one of the things that is quite common for Python. Okay. Like all of the packages that we've learned, Pandas, Pyomo, and so forth, people are actively working on them. They're making them better and better over time. And so the things that you've learned in class, they're going to change. Okay? Uh, and so this is a new package. And uh, what it does is uh, something called just-in-time compilation. What that means is it's, it can take uh, Python code and compile it to run on your uh, processor. Okay. The same way that uh, scipy weave was a nightmare to debug for the code that I wrote, uh, this is a nightmare to install. Okay. <laughs> like it, I timed it, and I think it took me like probably an hour to try to install it on this particular uh, Surface Pro, and it didn't work. But I did install it on our research machine. Okay, so uh, it works just fine there. I also installed it on my laptop. It works fine there. And maybe you will have luck installing it on your, uh, on your computer. But if you do, this thing is amazing. Okay, let's, let's read uh, what the code actually looks like. So uh, here we're going to start with an answer that's just, uh, uh, you know, the two zeros that we need. Uh, these are the parameters that we pull out of params.shape the data that we pull out, or the number of data points that we pull out of data.shape, 
And these are our same nested for loops that we look at like in the Python code. So we're going to iterate over the parameters. We're going to iterate over the data. The dot product starts at zero. We're going to iterate over the length of the vector. And to that product, we're going to add the parameters times the data. And we're going to take an exponent at the end. And at the last bit is we're going to take the reciprocal. Okay. And uh, so I'm running this code now um, on the research machine where I've installed everything, okay? So let's just time it, uh, time the output of uh, stand, standard Python on params and data, okay? So time it is a built-in uh, magic command on the IPython that lets you time the execution of a particular function call. And it does this in an interesting way. It's not just a single time of calling the function. It's going to loop many times and do some statistics on it to make sure that it gets a reasonably stable calculation for what the time is. So it takes about 145 milliseconds per loop uh, for standard Python. Okay. So let's do uh, vectorized Python. or our vectorized compute. So this is the bit that we spent a bunch of class to learn. Uh, and here it takes about 1.3 milliseconds per loop, okay? So about 100 times speed up from standard Python, which is pretty good. Uh, so let's do the uh, weave inline. Okay, so weave inline for this particular case, on this particular machine, is slightly slower than vectorized compute. It's about twice as slow as vectorized compute. Um, this is not true in general. Like on my laptop, weave inline was about three times as fast as vectorized compute. And probably if I passed in larger pieces of data, it might also end up being faster on the computerized machine. Generally, the inline C++ code is going to give you maybe two to three times speed up over vectorized compute but not in this particular case. And then l let's do the last one. Uh, let's see what I called that one. Number compiled. Okay, so it's insanely fast, right? Uh, it's three times faster than vectorized compute and uh, you know, on the order of 500-ish time faster than standard Python. But it looks exactly the same as standard Python, right? Like if we go back and look at the code, this function actually, there is nothing weird about this. Like pretty much nothing weird about this other than that, which is just from, imp uh, from number import this just-in-time compiler and just-in-time compile this function. The one other bit that had to do with a little bit debugging is if I make this answer be not 0.0, .0 but I make it 0, the function actually returns the wrong output. And the reason is because when you compile things, they have a, a fixed data type, kind of like in C. And so if this was zeros, then answer is going to be an integer. And it's not going to, it's going to return an integer 0 as opposed to a float. Okay? So that's why I have to do a 0, 0.0 to make that be a float. So that's kind of one tiny difference between standard Python uh, and this just-in-time compiled version of it. So my point is that if you want things to be fast, you can get them to be insanely fast if you spend the time to either write C++ code that you're going to stick into Python or spend the time to install Numba on your machine uh, and make sure that uh, it just-in-time compiles uh, things the right way. Okay, so thanks a lot for listening, and I'll see you all on Thursday.